Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much for inviting me, Nikita. It's wonderful to be here in several respects. Thank you all for being here as well, um, because it's very beautiful weather and the food is very good. We've experienced. I'm sorry I'm late. I'm just sorry I'm late. The waiter was a bit slower than we expected, and the food was a bit better than we expected. Okay, my uh, story. This, uh, this conference is about the bridge between theory and method. So what I want to do is discuss very concisely three sociological theories, try to link them to my favorite met method, which is actor-oriented network models, uh, and this all in the context of social semantic data, because as a former student of literature, I'm interested in semantics a little bit. Uh, before I will discuss those uh, uh, sociological theories, let me just briefly introduce how I view, view stochastic uh, actor-oriented models. There's a definition up there, which I made up myself, so it's just what I think it is. And the basic point is that I think it's very fruitful to consider activities of people in their local network con context as a response to what had, has previously passed within their direct neighborhood. And I think in that respect, I link up with uh, Tom Villanti in his keynote speech uh, yesterday <coughs> about you know, we can very well consider and imagine that people are influenced by the people who are just around them, but m many steps away in the network, which by definition is endless, we can't really uh, understand that. So why do I like stochastic actor-oriented models? And I'm going to drop the word stochastic because I think it's difficult to pronounce and perhaps we don't even need the statistics at all. First of all, perceptual adequacy, as I, as I see it, I think it's just more natural for us to consider persons as responding to their direct environment, which I just said. The second thing I like very much is that they, these models actual, actually um, see the human being as an agent, as someone who is acting and responding. I think this allows us to link up with all those behavioral hypotheses that have been formulated in the social scientific theories from decades ago, on the one hand, for example, in quantitative analysis for testing, but on the other hand, it also link, opens up the opportunity to do qualitative research because the perception of a person, of his or her environment, her network, uh, matters. Third, I like these models because they are dynamic. They're about evolution. They always consider action as something taking place in a context with previous action. And I think this history, I can't pronounce the word historicity, is essential to the social sciences. But I like very much those models. Can we apply them to social semantic networks? And if so, what kind of sociological theory would support that? There's a definition, definition of social semantic networks as well, which I'm going to skip. Just to go to the first theory, uh, social exchange theory. I start with this theory because I think that a lot of the actor-oriented models that are being developed, have been developed in the past decade, are basically were developed in a sociological context that is related to exchange theory. Um, not to go into details, but rational choice theory was the context in which uh, Tom Snyder's developed Siena software, for example. So let's go back to the first dead man in my presentation, George Homans. I'm going to, you know, I, I don't have a lot of time, and I'm not a very precise person, so I'm going to summarize this theory in a very strategic way, so it is going to fit the actor-oriented models. Okay, Homans. Human interaction, but also ties, especially effective ties, must be understood from exchange of rewards, and as a sociologist, Homans was very much interested in social approval as one of the main um, types of rewards. This has a, clearly has a relational aspect. It is, you know, human beings are exchanging rewards. And on the other hand, there is also a time dimension in it that uh, he, he says that we, human beings, we act upon experiences. We do particular things because we expect those to be rewarded. You know, he, this was really 
behavioralism, this is Skinner's pigeon, pressing a lever, just expecting a few grains to drop down. Right? So we do things because we expect a reward. Okay, where does language come in? Well, language is, and Homan stresses that as well, is one of the means for expressing uh, social approval, a very important means for doing that. So if we would look at social semantic networks from a social exchange theory perspective, my proposition is that we should look for expressions of social approval or social disapproval. Now, how could we relate this to actor-oriented models? Um, one of the five or seven propositions that are central in Homan's latest work <coughs> is the success proposition. This is just Skinner applied to sociology. You know, if interaction brings rewards, we will interact again. So if we have an ego who interacts with four alters, <coughs> and then one of these alters gives a reward in return, then the hypothesis is ego is going to interact again with alter number one. In a actor-oriented model, this is either the conformity effect, the black arrow is just a repetition of the gray one, or it's a reciprocity effect, the black arrow responds to the green one, the reward. Uh, also, in the same vein, ego is not likely to interact anymore with A3 because A3 has shown disapproval, has punished ego or withheld um, some kind of uh, uh, reward. Okay, this, I think, you know, this is the basic idea of an actor-oriented model, this type of effects, probabilities. Homan's second uh, proposition is stimulus opposition, which is basically the attribution effect that he says, well, you know, if particular people give rewards to us, then we think that getting the rewards is associated with characteristics of those people, so we're more likely to interact with people that have similar uh, characteristics because we have better expectations of getting a reward. So if A1 actually was blue and rewarded ego, then the hypothesis is that ego is more likely to interact not just with A1, but also with A5 and A2, the other blue ones. This, in an actor-oriented model, is called an alter-attribute effect particular characteristics of an alter will raise or lower the probability that he or she will be uh, interacted with. Now, up till now, we, we're just speaking about dyadic uh, interactions, ego with one alter at a time. And in Homer's theory, up till now, I haven't found any clue to include uh, more than just the di dyadic effects, to also include what is happening between alters. For example, if A2 and A6 were interacting, you know, according to Holman's theory, at least as far as I understand it, it's just not relevant. So things like transitivity, <coughs> if ego interacts with A2, uh, A2 rewards A6, then maybe ego has some special feeling for A6 as well. I couldn't find it with Holman's. Summary, social exchange theory as a um, theoretical base for doing actor-oriented models. Incentives are central. <coughs> social approval is a very important incentive. Semantic content should then be used to uh, measure social approval and disapproval among human beings. And the context of explanation is what happened before in the near neighborhood, the local neighborhood of ego. No, I don't know whether you buy it, but I'll just go on with the next, second theory, which is field theory, which I will discuss mainly based on the work by Pierre Bourdieu. I think the main difference between field theory and exchange theory in respect of social semantic data, etc., etc., is that in field theory, the valence, the, the value of, for especially attributes, <coughs> is supposed to be collective. Whereas in exchange theory, you know, 
In my particular case, the blue guy gave me a reward, so now I love blue. But for anyone else, it could have been the red or the yellow or the green one. Right? So the valence in the exchange theory is more or less an individual thing, whereas in field theory, it is supposed to be collectively dis, um, con constructed, defined. And this is not just some process, this collective construction of uh, value, which is without you know, struggles. So field theory is much says, you know, we're not all equal. If you would enter social network analysis at this time and you really know nothing of statistics, then you know you're at a disadvantage since statistical uh, models like the exponential random graph models are supposed to be very important at this point of time in social network analysis, in the field of social network analysis. Field theory, therefore, is much more about dominance, about stratification, about domination and deference, you know, who wins, who loses. And <clears throat> what is important, I think, to understand is that the determination of the criteria for, we you know, what is important and what is not important is just one of the things that is at stake in the struggle going on within the field. Like in social network analysis, now we have some people you know, claiming that you know, they're going to be uh, they make a point of doing qualitative network analysis and you cannot, you, I mean, I see that from field theoretic perspective as an effort to say, you know, uh, urgence is not the big thing, it's not the only thing, you know, we, there are more important things. And so they try to change <coughs> what is important and what is less or unimportant within the field. Okay, so if we would take a field theory approach to social semantic networks, uh, I think we would be looking for ranking and classification. The, at the one hand, we have the interactions between people, the relations, or how, however you want to call it, <coughs> and there, I think, we should look for signs of deference, submission, or domination. You know, it's who's the top dog and who is not. Some call this the material practice, what we can see what is going on. Uh, when we're interested in fields of intellectual production, as Bourdieu calls them, and I happen to be interested in those fields, like art, science, politics, you know, where we, the production is concepts or knowledge of, or ideas, then language is a very, very important measure, uh, uh, means for expressing domination and deference. You know? I study literary criticism and there, you know, you have a review and they say it's good or it's bad or it's worse than bad. Right? So this is on the one hand what we should look at, but language also plays another role in field theory, namely as social classifications. You know, <coughs> efforts of people within the field to define the field, to say, well, we have this category and we have this category and that category. category seemingly you know, objective descriptions of types of people or types of uh, uh, things, but in a discourse usually there is value attached to some of them and others are being uh, downgraded. So there are connotations, valences constructed. And this could be called the symbolic structure. And then the idea of field theory is that the material and the symbolic structure have a dynamic interplay they affect each other over time. Well, field theory in two slides, this cannot be clear. Um, and I'm just trying to give an example. This one is from my own work, it's about literary criticisms. Here we have a set of literary authors. It's in the Netherlands, 1970s, quite young authors. Uh, they, in interviews and reviews, they, <coughs> they critique or praise each other. The solid lines are positive evaluations, the dotted lines are negative evaluations. And for some period, I just collected those uh, evaluations and they're in the network up there. And, uh, and then at that point of time, somewhere in 1977, there is a critic, one of the uh, more important critics writing for a, uh, a big newspaper who wrote an article assigning those authors to particular literary movements. So what we have is we have a classification, you know, the 
blue ones, they were called the ironic realists, and, for example, the red ones were called the academists. Now, this seems to be just two concepts, you know, that assign a difference, but basically in the discourse, ironic realism was supposed to be something not very, uh, not very grown up, whereas academism was supposed to be you know, very intellectually powered, powerful. So we see a classification which at the same time assigns some values. Now let's have a look at the period after the publication of this classification. Again, those authors, <coughs> they evaluate each other's work not so very much, partly because part of the blue authors just disappeared from the scene. Uh, and still, we, we could say probably, it's not a, well, it's the best example I could find, and still it's hard to see, but that this classification in its turn probably also influenced the evaluations that came later. For now, the red uh, authors, the academists, <coughs> are mainly negative about the blue ones, which is in line with the difference in quality or status that was associated with those two uh, concepts of literary movements. There is also a, a dotted line, a positive line, going to one particular author, and she happened to be the only female author in the blue, no, one of the two female authors, but she was the part, well, you know, there are exceptions, there are more things at play, but this is the basic idea. <coughs> Patterns of evaluations, you know, turn out are being uh, um, uh, made into classifications, and those classifications then may influence the uh, interactions between the classified people. So, field theory focus on social ranking. Uh, think of asymmetric relations, think of positive versus negative evaluations. Um, in terms of network analysis, we go to balanced theory and ranked clusters type of uh, structures. But also have a look at the classifications that are being published within the field that are known to the, to the people and have a good look at the connotations of those classifications and then try to find out whether one over time influences the other. All right, here he is again. He was very popular yesterday, um, less popular today, but I'll, I'll try. Niklas Luhmann's systems theory. Now, I think this is really, you know, if you have a theory which says that the human being is not part of the system, then actor-oriented models, you know, they should really not be applicable. Uh, but, you know, I just changed the theory so much that probably we can. What do I take from Luhmann? To Luhmann, systems are important, and important that systems preserve themselves by being different from other systems. What are systems? I have no clue, but meaning, Zin, seems to be important. And somewhere in his book, Die Gesellschaft der Gesellschaft, I found some paragraphs saying that these systems are based on sets of loosely coupled words. An eigen, a system has, uh, um, well, a media, well, I'm not going to, to try even to translate that. For the German speakers here, uh, I guess that will suffice. And for the others, I'm sorry. If we look at applications of, uh, and, uh, of, of, of uh, working with semantic data, semantic network data, for example, for example, for my colleague Lute Leidesdorf, then we see that usually what has been done is that some kind of association between concepts is being created. And then what's next? Usually some kind of algorithm is used or technique to find cohesive subgroups. And those cohesive subgroups are being you know, interpreted as different scientific subdisciplines or perhaps different, uh, what was the word, uh, discourse formations, as I've heard this morning in a presentation. So my simple understanding is that systems have some, something to do with cohesion among Concepts, for example, better meanings, but uh, we'll see. If that will be the case, then the general principle of autopoiesis, the ability of a system to 
you know, maintain itself would actually mean that you know, maybe words will change that are associated with this system. Maybe links between words, associations between uh, words may change within the system. But somehow, if new words enter, they will be linked ag again with the rest. Um, the, the metaphor, of course, or maybe not the metaphor, metaphor, but the real thing, our cells in our body are changing all the time, but still the body persists. Translating this to an actor-oriented model, or maybe I should say a word or a meaning-oriented model, because there are no more actors, means that we're basically speaking about transitivity or closure. You know, basically predicting that if particular words belong to a system or a subsystem, then there is a higher probability for them to relate to each other than to other systems. And since they are part of the system because they are related with some with other con concepts within the system, it's just, you know, closure. What does it look like? <clears throat> this is an example, this is a fantasy. This is not real data, but it's based on a publication by Lud Leidersdorf. Uh, it's about title words in the social science information thing, index journal, I don't know. It's not so important. Uh, there is a structure of those concepts and I must admit, Lut Leidersdorf does, does something very differently, but basically what he does is cohesive subgroups, detection, and giving names to them. We have uh, ethnology, organizational sociology, and migration studies. Now, what would an actor-oriented model do, do here or predict? He say, well, imagine that one word disappears, or one title word, another word ar arises, You know, this new word will be connected to some other words. Um, and basically now the prediction is it will connect further with those concepts with which it has common neighbors. Transitivity effect, we get those lines, which means that this new word, say Syria in migration studies, <coughs> will be, become part of the migration study system. So we have words appearing and disappearing, we have links appearing and disappearing, but overall we still have cohesive subgroups for the different disciplines. Uh, no, I'm not going to provoke loot too much. <clears throat> so, system theory, probably some way, you know, we could do that with social semantic data if we uh, construct a network from associations, uh, I think you should somehow focus on key concepts. For example, title words are being used uh, a lot, but the entire contents of uh, scientific articles usually are not. There are too many words that are everywhere, probably. And then look for clustering or actually predict a transitivity or closure effect. This brings me to my conclusion, for which I want to present you a painting by Pavel Vilonov, who is a St. Petersburg uh, artist. Um, this, I'm not sure, I think this painting, at least several paintings um, by this uh, artist are in the uh, Russian Museum here in St. Petersburg, and I really re recommend that museum. Um, this painting is uh, titled Heads. Well, quite some paintings and drawings by Filonov uh, have this title Heads, but the subheading is Man in the World. So, this basically is a visualization of sociology. What I like about this painting is not just that there are many heads and that they are somehow related to each other, so interacting, but if you look closely, then the greatest detail in the picture is within the heads. Now, if you would go to the Russian Museum, I advise to take a looking glass because if you really look what is inside those heads, it's social semantic networks. And if you bring a microscope and zoom in further, you will see that several theories have different perspectives on the social semantic network. I thank you very much. Thank you a lot, Wouter. I think much more details are available in the paper by Wouter, which was sent around to everyone, which I think is really worth it. It deserves a very strong attention. 
Questions, comments, please. Most welcome. Lute, would you like to? <laughs> so, oh, really? Oh. It's a very little question. Can you explain a little bit why do you choose this series? Just put your hormones and lumen. Uh, the question is, can I explain something more about those series? No, why do you choose this series? Why did I choose those? Um, I chose hormone theory because I think it is, the, um, it is representative of the theory in which the, at least the statistical actor-oriented models were developed in the last decade. As I said, Tom Snyders, who developed Siena, and I think Siena really pushed the case for an actor-oriented model. Uh, he worked in Groningen in the context of uh, Sigvard Linden, Hartberg, I forget, which is a rational uh, choice theory. Uh, and I think that harks back to uh, Holmes. Um, I selected Lumen because I think that um, most applications to social semantic networks or semantic networks for themselves actually use this word by word association technique and I thought uh, well I thought that Lumen as a system theory would be most uh, appropriate for that approach and also my dear colleague Lud Leidersdorf has something with Lumen so I just want to provoke him a little bit. Then there is field theory and well, basically, I selected field theory because I was raised in this theory. Uh, so, and I was very um, eager to include some of my own work. Thank but you. Uh, again, no, this is, this is a bit of a, a, a joke. The thing is that in um, America, uh, social, uh, sociologists like Ron Breiger and John Moore, um, they... I think have developed a very strong case for this classification type of approach and they also refer a lot to uh, Pierre Bourdieu. Thank you for this, that was uh, uh, most interesting. I, I wanted to ask you whether you consider actor-oriented models uh, that it would be possible for the type of modeling you do on actor-oriented models to fit in, um, to go beyond, uh, if you like, uh, 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 Skinner's perspective into uh, Kahneman and Tversky prospect theory behavioral approach to, um, uh, to agency, which in other words makes uh, mental shortcuts and is not uh, purely rational. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for this question. Um, um, actually, I hope that trying to link this type of model to, for example, field theory and even worse, to system theory without actors at all would make the case that it is absolutely not necessary to have a behaviorist or rational choice type of, uh, um, of approach. Um, because um, I think the essential condition is that you believe that people, whether rational or irrational, uh, somehow respond to what has happened in their direct environment, in their, let's say, the network environment. But the response might be widely different from um, a, a rational perspective, a rational choice perspective, where I choose him because he's similar to somebody that, from whom I have um, interacted with in the past. So my, my mental shortcut might be um, significantly different from that. Or at least that's what Kahneman and Tversky claim. So all behavioral economics now claims that that's the case. That, in other words, we do not act in a rational, uh, oh, purely rational behavior. Uh, okay, um, do I understand correctly that you wonder whether it will poss be possible to refute the claim that all behavior is rational? And, and that it could be modeled like this. Uh, I think I don't. I don't think you can ever uh, refuse the claim that all behavior is rational because once you find behavior that seems irrational, they make it rational for other reasons. Well, uh, this is a strong position, uh, but you know I, I think it. Um, the thing is that you. Sh I think that this type of model will allow you 
to apply in other theoretical contexts as well. And I think the important thing about theories, theories is that they tell you where to look. So it's about the types of variables, maybe even the type of measurement that you will qualitative versus quantitative that you select. Um, yeah. I got the microphone. Thank you, Wouter. This was a very beautiful presentation. <laughs> and, uh, I'm, I'm in, behind the scene, I'm also reading Bourdieu, of course. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I agree very much with many things which you said. But let's take the picture which is on the, on the screen at the moment. Uh, if you take Siena, then the problem of Siena is that it is... Uh, the, the, the distance you can see as an actor is only limited. It's one or two steps. Uh, uh, Tom Snyder somewhere says it is myope in a certain sense. And overcoming the myopi, the myopi is that the right word in English? Myopi? Uh, yeah. in, it helps for us to use, for example, the concept of Luhmann. But it is not the person of Luhmann. It is a concept, a symbol which we use, which helps us to overcome that short sight. Yeah, that, that myop, myopic uh, character. So we can communicate not only with our neighbors, but we can also communicate with someone in Bielefeld who is also interested in that. Without having to go by train to see him or to call him. So we have a symbolic supra-individual structure there. I, I would say, particularly in science, which steers us. Yeah? And, and, and of course, it's very Lumenian, but I, I just thought, let me... Let me raise that issue because it is the, the system of reference is then super individual. And while you are making a very strong plea here for taking the individual actor as the system of reference. Yeah, okay. So um, the organizer must really cut us off one because we are close colleagues. And this, this seems to be a new step in our discussion. And so it can go on for a long time. I, I, try, to, I try to be short. Uh, Siena, in the first place, Siena is just one particular st statistical model for applying the idea of an actor-oriented model. Sure. S second, uh, so it can be done in different ways as well. Um, second, Siena tends to be used for little groups that are really interacting face-to-face, -face, uh, a class at a school, that kind of thing. Uh, but I think the important uh, aspect of an actor-oriented model is that it allows you to define your network you have seen the people who are relevant to you in any way. So in science, it is personal contact. It's probably not the most important type of uh, 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 criterion to choose, you know, which are the authors that you could or would interact with. Um, and then for the short-sightedness, the myopia, um, I mean, if we are more liberal in defining the social network as actually those contacts that are relevant to a person, mm -hmm. you know, I think it is not that short-sighted anymore uh, in the sense that it can include quite some uh, people. And in addition, um, the, um, it, it may change from person to person. And I think then we should accept the premise that this is the relevant network for this person. Why look further? Thank you so much. Okay, anyone else? Yes. Thank you for this presentation, and uh, my question is very little. Uh, so uh, I'm wondering, uh, if you focus on uh, studying uh, political networks, uh, would you use uh, the same uh, theories, or maybe one of them, or maybe another theories? Uh, so if I would study political networks? With their uh, specifics. Yeah. Um, if I would do it, you know, I'm almost, I know nothing else than field theory. So that would do it for me, but probably not for anyone who is not into field, field theory. Uh, the, uh, so... I'm afraid I don't have a general answer there. I think, again, the theory is there to inspire you to say, well, this is what I think I see happening in politics, so I'm going for this theory. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ah, 
Another question. Hello, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my only question is, if you include um, field theory and ideas of Bourdieu that I think are very interesting to be included on social network analysis, why still calling it actor, um, stochastic actor-oriented models? I mean, are they actor-oriented only? There are broader structures you're bringing in. So why maintaining the name? So why the name? Uh, because I believe that... Um, because I believe that the thing that we uh, should try to explain is what human beings are doing. Or perhaps, if we follow Luhmann, we, we say, well, we, we know there are human beings, but you know, we just, they're just the environment. We, see only, we, we only look at their products for the text, for example. So I think, I think the, the power for, for this model, for network analysis in general, to make just a bold claim, is that you know, it draws us our attention that people will, are very likely in many situations to respond to their direct network. Therefore, I, I still think it's network analysis, although there is no analysis of overall structure of networks at all. You know, for quite some time, I haven't made any overall network structure analysis anymore. So this is answer your question. Or you, and the stochastic, I'm willing to drop it because I think this type of model can be applied just as well in qualitative analysis. Thank you, Walter.